So, the book is called Seven Stages of Marriage, and I have eight stages up there. We actually added uh, an eighth stage, which is widow or widower. So we have um, that stage after we get through the seven. We also have um, um, Mary Tooney here to represent the widow stage tonight. So this is the book that we are going to talk about. Last year was the first year we did this panel. It was really fun. We had a completely different panel last year. And one of our, pan our mentor couples, Mike and Diane Vosco, went through and just did very detailed notes on each stage. So um, that is what I'm going to be using. But here is the book uh, that we will be using tonight. Like I said, if you afterwards you want to check it out, feel free. So let's get started. The eight stages of marriage. All marriages evolve over time. Every marriage is unique. Change never, ever stops. Right? Do you all agree so far? <laughs> a few things to remember. Be a supporter of one another. One of the biggest trust breakers is when one spouse publicly, publicly puts the other spouse down in front of friends, colleagues, or family. When you're frustrated in your marriage, uncover those hidden expectations about marriage. Sometimes they're shocking, sometimes humorous, but often vulnerable beliefs. And not all expectations are unreasonable. If you agree to some realistic expectations, it's going to create a win-win situation and a feeling of success. One of the toughest jobs in marriage is accepting that some items on your must-have list will never be fulfilled by your partner, simply because he or she is not perfect, and also because he or she isn't obligated to be your personal fairy godmother. You could sulk. You could get angry, or you can do what every couple needs to do over the long term, which is grieve the losses that come with making that commitment of marriage. So we're going to start with the passion stage. Now, if you're going, oh, I think I might be in that stage, but not everything, not every trait I say will probably match up with you. So just keep that in mind as we go through each stage, figuring out what stage you're in, all the points might not apply to you, but you'll be able to figure it out. So stage one is passion. Look at the cute picture of Olivia and Matt. <laughs> so you see yourselves as newlyweds. You feel badly in love. You crave your partner when you're apart and when you're together. You live in your own private romantic world. Your relationship is all about passion, excitement, sex, and intimacy. You have a hard time focusing on things other than your relationship. You've been married for two years or less, though some report the honeymoon stage lasting five years or longer. So I'm going to have Olivia and Matthew join me up here. Here's their beautiful family. Come on up, guys. So i got to put this over by you. So just tell us a little bit about yourselves and your family, and then they're going to share a little bit about being in this stage. My name is Olivia Zeman and this is my husband Matthew. Uh, we will be celebrating our second anniversary in September of this year, so we are still in the newlywed phase. Uh, this is our family. We have Madison, who is our 11-year-old, and then we have Charlotte. She just turned one in around May 23rd, and then we recently welcomed Greta, who is going to be six weeks on Monday. Um, as you can see, we very, very much are in the passion stage. <laughs> right. um, a little bit about us. Um, so we've been married, like I said, almost two years. Madison is Matthew's um, daughter from a previous relationship who I have come to love as my own, and um, Together with our two little ones, we just, uh, you know, feel like the perfect family right now. And it keeps us very busy. So one of the main things with our stage of our relationship right now, we both work full time. We are very involved in the community and we have our family. So one of the most important things for us is making sure that we still focus on us and on our relationship. So... Being involved in great marriages, being able to come to these date nights and get a babysitter and have time alone is really important to us. Um, we are constantly doing things to, you know, 
maintain our intimacy and really focus on the two of us, even though we have so much more to focus on. <laughs> uh, we, we definitely have a very busy lifestyle, but at this stage in our relationship, and especially with having Madison before we you know, got married, we were already parents, so we had to work on that before we were married and continuing it even past our, our honeymoon stage and making sure that we maintain that intimacy and that personal relationship with each other um, is just so important to us. So focusing on <laughs> spending that time together and, and leaning on each other through these times. Did you have anything to What she said. It's easier to look pretty, it's fine. <laughs> So I just have to say that they are very passionate. Like I see her Facebook posts, and Matthew is always doing sweet things for her, and it's like, oh. So, so you guys are doing a great job. So Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I am just going to go through each stage. Then has missions to it. Like we want to talk about. You can stay there until I know what these um, Each stage has. How do you get through this stage with grace? Stay together. Have fun. <laughs> So there's a five-part mission of the passion stage. So it's to savor and remember all the glories of the passion stage, to forge a rock-solid sense of we, which it sounds like these two have done, practice your partner's native love language. So if you saw up there, we had two date nights called Love on the Beach. That's all about the five love languages. We actually do three events per year on the five love languages that tells you how important we think it is to learn how to speak each other's love language and we have july 27th august 24th and october 12th here in the office that one was a little bit deeper build trust respect and emotional closeness and expand your sexual vocabulary through touch pleasure and a new sense of the erotic so woohoo <laughs> All right, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. So, stage two, we move from passion to realization. So, you may be in this stage if the initial romance and passion of your marriage are fading a little bit, you find yourselves negotiating things you never worried about before. You are frequently explaining things about yourself to your partner. You spend a lot of time establishing rules for how you'll function as partners. Your partner suddenly seems less than perfect. You discover he or she has flaws and imperfections just like everybody else. For the first time, you might find your spouse annoying, irritating, or even boring. You have asked yourself recently if you made the right choice in a mate. You've been married for at least six months, and couples may start experiencing the challenges of this stage even sooner or as long as two years after marrying. So, Shannon Blake, I stole pictures off of Facebook so they didn't know what was going to come up. <laughs> yeah, we were hoping there were good ones. You like those? Yeah. All right. Good. So, tell us a little bit about you and how long you've been married and yeah. what you wanted to share. So, I'm Shannon. This is Blake Enders. We've been married for almost two years. Fun fact, we got married on the same date as Olivia and oh, Matt. Yeah. So, we've got that in common. Um, but we met when we were 17 years old in high school. So, I went to North High School. He went to South. So, we have this consistent rival in the house <laughs> of which is the better high school in Sheboygan. Um, we're both very involved in the community. Our family, while we don't have kids... We have fur animals, so we've got two dogs and a cat, so I like to say our house is a zoo at the moment. <laughs> and then, um, so I work for Kohler Company, and then Blake works for Faith Technologies. And then Blake has a great example on our realization stage as well. Okay. Yeah, so I have this um, really nice sheet that she printed out for me. Um, <laughs> Good job. Yes, extremely organized. <laughs> So uh, basically, we're beginning to get to know, to know each other's uh, strengths and weaknesses. So communication is huge for us, and we are always striving to kind of keep an open line of communication because it's it's extremely important to try to get across what um, 
get our points across, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But we're both extremely stubborn. So everybody always wants to be right. But when it comes to us, it's like, I'm always right. So, <laughs> so for her, she has the same mindset. So it, it, we always are butting heads that way. Um, but we, we are complete opposites. So we kind of complement each other in that, in that respect. She's extremely book smart and, um, does really well in school and everything that way where I'm more, um, I don't want to say like common sense, but like, I guess street smart. Um, I can, I can just kind of recognize things faster that she can. So we kind of compliment each other that way. And I don't mean that, I don't mean that in a bad way. Like, it's just like, this is not on the yeah, it's, 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 it's hard to explain, but it, it works. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, so we, we kind of spoke about it today. Um, and we try to figure out what each other's weaknesses were. So I guess my biggest weakness is, um, like spending money. Um, I'm kind of the type where if, if I really want something, I'm just going to go get it. And she loves to save money and invest it into more important things for our future. And I'm more of like, I need this right now. Um, whereas her weakness is acting upon emotion without critically thinking. So if she gets really upset about something, she'll, she'll just latch onto that and not think clearly. Um, so we kind of try to work on each other with that on both sides. Um, let's see here. It's all about compromise. So again, about the communication, um, laying out details, we try to kind of sit down and like I said, when she's being extremely emotional about something, I'll try to sit down and say, Hey, like this is, this is what we're doing. And same thing with the money. Whereas if I'm spending a ton of money, she'll sit me down and be like, look, these are our bills. This is what we're trying to save for. Like you need to, you need to stop putting money into ridiculous things. Um, but when it does come to those things, you know, I always try to be optimistic about things or reassuring, whereas Shannon tries to see it at the end of the world, you know, I'll, I'll go buy something that she might not think is important, but I do. Um, so we again, try to talk it out. Um, again, where we kind of complement each other. So, uh, recently we helped my father-in-law Gary and mother-in-law Roz, they bought a house and we flipped it and bought it from them. And it was, it was kind of a big project for us. And, um, I'm, I'm really, I can work really well with my hands. I can, you know, figure stuff out that way, but she's definitely like the designer. So we worked really well together because she knew what she wanted and I was able to complete it. So, um, we thought that was a really good example. Um, yeah, she likes to say we're like a Chip and Joanna Gaines. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's pretty much what we came up with for the realization stage. Well, and just so you know, women being more emotional, that's pretty, much <laughs> pretty standard. <laughs> All right. 80% plus of the population. So you're not alone there. <laughs> yeah. So what are the missions for this realization stage? So get in the driver's seat. It's time to make love happen instead of waiting for it to happen. Keep on doing those passion stage missions. Uncover cover your hidden marriage expectations. So I talked about a little bit in the beginning. Um, they mentioned some of them actually. Some of them could be jobs and money, outside interests, sex and affection, other friendships. Are you going to have male, female friendships? Time together, vacations, housework, yard work, emotional needs and intimacy, learning from each other, family relationships, Tons of different expectations that you might have that are very different from each other. So this is probably the stage where it's going to come to a head and you have to figure out, like you two are, how do we work together? How do we make this work? So um, next one is learn to talk calmly and confidently about your needs and wants. So that's kind of self-explanatory. One of the things that I think we cover in mentoring too is about using I statements Instead of making an accusation, I feel this, instead of saying, you made me this. Um, also avoid using always, you always, you never. Um, that breeds hostility. Next one is learn to listen empathetically to your spouse. So this comes with, uh, we call it active listening. So one of the first skills you learn in mentoring is this active listening where they teach you, say something, the other person needs to repeat it back, 
and then you say, yes, that's what I meant, or no, that's not what I meant, here's what I meant. So you're actively listening, and for most women, um, we are more feelings-oriented, so as a, for the men, try to listen for those feelings before you jump in with a solution and pepper her with questions. <laughs> Make sure that you understand if she wants you to fix something or just listen, because that's important. Be your real full self and let your spouse be himself or herself as well. Sort out the laundry, the dishes, the vacuuming. The point here is split your household chores, like have a conversation about it. And then become expert money managers. It sounds like Shannon's got this down. Uh, what is your money personality? Are you a spender? Are you the chief financial officer? Are you a stasher? Or are you a fighter? So you, each couple has to make a plan that works for them. And we actually have an event on October 26th that's called Planning Your Retirement Together. That's actually going to be a faith-based event. Um, if you're interested in learning how to work together on planning for retirement, that would be a good one for you. So that is it for realization. Thank you, Shannon. Oh, yeah. hopefully for questions at the end so if you're thinking of questions if you have a question for the people that are up here just go ahead and shoot your hand up and we'll let you ask it now otherwise if you want to wait till the end I will try to build in some time so after you realize what your spouse is all about then you start this lovely stage called rebellion uh, you may be in this stage if you and your spouse are having regular power struggles you or your spouse has had an affair or is close to having one one or both of you feel a consistent desire for freedom and independence to pursue individual interests. You might find yourself backing away from your spouse in your marriage. You've been married for at least two years, although the rebellion stage can start earlier, especially if you live together first or you date a long time, and last for years or even decades. I hope not, because this is the stage we're in right now. <laughs> so. So if you find yourself judging your marriage and your partner in stark absolutes of right and wrong, you're caught in the power struggle of this rebellion stage. It's often a dramatic phase of marriage. Your relationship feels like an over-the-top opera full of fierce emotions, arguments, vulnerability, secrets, and threats of divorce. The rebellion phase is one of the most demanding and risky in marriage. Many couples at this stage make it work with a healthy dose of respect, empathy, and friendship for each other, and the ability of each spouse to pursue his or her interests and passions with the other spouse's consent and support. The main underlying rebellion stage strife is a belief that you have become trapped by your marriage by a spouse who doesn't do as he or she should, and worse, demands unfair things of you, and by a legal commitment that shuts you off from both growth and fun. Rebellion stage couples are quick to blame each other for difficulties. Eventually, you figure out that you really can't change your partner. There's a not. Uh, one, right? <laughs> but there's something and someone you can change, which is you. So treat the spouse, treat your spouse the way you'd like to be treated, the golden rule. Give them the benefit of the doubt more often. Find big and little things to appreciate every day and spend more time with your spouse without being asked. The result is a guaranteed uptick in marital happiness for both of you. So, come on, honey, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'll move my nose. So I... We have been married for, yep, sit down. We've been married for, <laughs> tell them what to do. You know who's the boss. <laughs> we just had our five-year anniversary, so mm -hmm. it's the second marriage for both of us. Um, and I did not prepare a story because I said I'm going to be talking the whole night, so I don't even know what he's going to say, so <laughs> hopefully it'll be good. <laughs> I just wanted to share a little story, uh, maybe indicative of, you know, this this phase that that we're in, I guess. So, um, we, uh, I, I like to think we have a great marriage. It certainly has its challenges at times, especially with five children between us. I brought three into the marriage from a previous marriage. She brought two in from a previous marriage. And um, so the example I had was um, when I get to work, I like to uh, focus on work and not really do a lot of personal stuff when I'm there, and uh, I know that Jocelyn's love language is that she likes contact and likes getting a text in the morning, 
before I leave work and maybe at lunchtime. So I typically do that now. And as soon as I get in and my computer is warming up, I will shoot her a quick, quick text and either tell her I love her or good morning or something. And um, so one I was like, night... Where's this going? That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, see, she doesn't know the, the story I was going to share with you. And uh, so one day, though, of course, uh, I get distracted and my short-term memory is not great. And, and so this one night I left work, picked up uh, some groceries and gas... Failed to tell her that I was going to do that, so I was like an hour later than usual, and she was like really upset with me. But wait, he said on my way, and then went and did the grocery store. Oh yeah, I did and do that. Thing. So yeah. I expect him to be home in a yeah, half hour, so I think true. he's like dead in the ditch somewhere, because now it's been like an hour and a half since he left, so... You right, forgot that's, that. You forgot that tidbit. That's true. That's true. <laughs> you have this happen to you? Well, we're there. We're yeah, <laughs> I did forget that detail, but so. So, so anyways, I yeah, so I did text once, but not a second time that I was delayed. I just decided, oh, I forgot. We need some milk and eggs or whatever, and I'm running low on gas. So, anyways, I'm home about an hour later, and she's really upset with me, and uh, I guess I rebelled by not texting her that next morning when I went to work. Oh, I don't remember. Oh, okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> this is a long yeah. time ago. So, uh, yeah, this is probably a year or two ago now, right? Probably. Yeah, so I still do the routine every day, but that next day I didn't. I thought, you know, I'm changing and, and you know, sending her texts during the day and Checking in all the time, telling her most of the time where I am. And this one time, I, you know, occasionally I'll, I'll mess up like this one time I did. And so, uh, so I didn't send her one the next morning. And then we. So that made things little, even better, right? Right. <laughs> so we had a little chat about that uh, when I got home that night. All right. so. Alrighty. So this. Red highlighted part here is important. Staying together now takes a combination of understanding and hard work. Of course, all marriage is hard work, but this stage especially. Plus a generous sprinkling of fun time out, time out together. So here's our missions. Turn power struggles into acceptance. Convert conflicts into productive problem solving. So that can be difficult, but some tips they have are decide if you've got a problem or just a difference in preference. So we're actually going through love and respect right now. I don't know, have, has anyone ever gone through love and respect, either the book or the DVD series? Um, it's one of my favorites. It's Emerson Egrich, and he talks about um, arguments, and most struggles couple has are because of preference, and we have... We had a struggle this morning about preference. So it's like most arguments end up about just being about, I want to do it this way, you want to do it that, and we're both extremely stubborn as well and think we're both right. So also practice loving acceptance. Banish the deal breakers. Figure out what those are for you. So we just did an event two weeks ago called How to Fight Fair. So we have actually posted that on our resources page now, and he goes through like 16 steps of how to fight fair and encourages couples to come up with their deal breakers, like what can you not say or do when you're having an argument. So I would highly recommend that you check that out. Uh, take timeouts early and often. We're still not very good at that, but we'll try. Yeah, we're better. We're getting better. Uh, pursue healthful, healthy personal goals. That's pretty self-explanatory. Renew your spirituality. Um, this isn't a faith-based event tonight, so I won't go too much into detail with that one. Um, but if you have faith or one person goes to church, one person doesn't want to, just make sure you're talking about talking through those things. Uh, recover from any infidelities. Uh, we have some sh copies over there, but if you check out the book, uh, there's a page in here, page 156, if you're taking notes, has six steps for the unfaithful spouse, and page 157 has nine steps for the betrayed spouse. So if you are, have been through that or you know someone, there's some great um, tips about recovering from that in here. And then mastering the art of forgiveness. They talk about the new infidelities, not just physical infidelity, but emotional infidelity. Um, very common. 
Uh, you get attached to somebody of the opposite sex emotionally because it usually starts by just sharing personal things with somebody of the opposite sex. Um, there's also financial infidelity, so maybe you have separate accounts, maybe you keep secrets, maybe you don't know what the other person is doing with their money. Um, you know, it should really be, everything should be ours. Um, and then work infidelity. Uh, if you know Pastor Andy Shanholtz at all, I mentioned him earlier. He, he, I just heard his whole life testimony. He talks about how work was his mistress. Like he was married to his work. He just worked, 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 didn't spend any time with his family. So that can be a big issue. So you have to learn how to forgive. Um, and there's you know different steps to forgiveness, understanding how you feel about the perceived wrong, putting the past behind you, See your partner in a loving light. Remember the relief of you being forgiven. Empathize with your partner's shortcomings. Ask for an apology if you need one. Reaffirm your loving relationship. Understand your own weaknesses. And then forgive yourself too. So building trust is of course important and it stays important your whole married life. Uh, there's some things you can do to build trust after something like that happens and it's being transparent. So transparency is so important in marriage and being totally open with your spouse. Talk about everything. Um, nowadays, you know, there's social media, email, all these things. Make sure you're open and you're sharing your passwords. Um, don't have hidden conversations, especially with someone of the opposite sex. Um, if you have iPhones, I don't know if regular phones, you can share your location with your spouse. So maybe you know where they were. Um, that you weren't in the ditch. <laughs> um, and then talk about all financial decisions. So no secrets because trust is built on transparency. And if you refuse to do those things, it, it, even if you're not doing anything wrong, it kind of looks like you might be hiding something. So it's probably a good idea to just be totally transparent with each other. All right, you're off the hook. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So you might be in this stage. You may have children still living at home. They might be gone. Uh, you probably own a house or a condo. Both of you probably have dynamic professional careers, and, or there might be a stay-at-home mom and, and one working or stay-at-home dad. Money management is a big issue in this stage due to lots of money either coming into or going out of your accounts. Your to-do list on any given day is so long, it could never be completed in 24 hours. So in this stage, it's encouraged to make an effort to put your marriage first. So you're busy, busy, busy. The cooperation st stage can leave you too stressed out <coughs> and too tired to connect emotionally and physically with your partner. And the result is that conflicts may go unresolved. Emotional walls may go up because you're too tired to share what's really happening in your heart and your soul. So, let's bring up Sebastian and Leonora. Isn't their wedding picture? <laughs> you two youngsters. She's cooperating today. This She's girl. cooperating today. <laughs> so, tell us a little bit about you. Oh, Chinese fire girl. How long have you been married? All that fun stuff. <clears throat> well, we have been married for 29 years. Very soon, 30 years. And... Uh, um, we were married in Germany originally from there, but have been living in Sheboygan County for the last 30 years, plus years. Uh, we have three children. They are um, 27, 25, and 23, and um, two boys, and no, actually two girls and one boy. Two boys, huh? Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> one X. And um, so about the cooperation stage, um, Sebastian is uh, very busy with work and was traveling a lot. And at times that was very hard to um, bring it together with the kids and um, with time for us. So we always made it a priority that we have a date night and also that we have a vacation once a year. And the vacation meant without the children. So we had either dropped them off at my parents, if that was possible, not always, or we had a, had a babysitter. Or what we did is we found um, dear friends who are in the same situation. They have children the same ages as we did 
And so the kids were good friends with each other, and that worked really beautiful until we had the third child, and then our um, friend actually... <laughs> Nobody wanted three? <laughs> no, they got a pit bull terrier, and that was... <coughs> we had to work through that, um, but we did, and um, so we had weekends where we could actually go somewhere and, and do things uh, as a couple versus um, having three little people around us the whole time. And that is very important because you need to be connected with your spouse, you need to communicate, and when you have little people, it's, it's tough, very tough. Mm -hmm. so. um, I think this is, this is all correct. I think one of the issues, so we had no family here. We basically were the only ones. So we have it really, it was difficult. We really had to get really... Um, creative, uh, finding babysitters, finding... So babysitters is an issue because uh, some people may say, look, we cannot afford babysitters. They cost too much money. You know, then you look for a network. We looked actually for networks of moms um, that actually or families that had children, and we would actually share taking care of each other's children just to get away for... Vacation is nice. We did that. We were able to do that. But sometimes just a long weekend, just one overnighter would be great. Um, it's that moment, but I think the one thing I wanted to definitely share is be intentional about it. Make a point to talk about it. Make a point to say, it's, it's very easy when you get into it to say, well, another week is gone, we didn't have time, we really haven't talked, uh, it's stressful, everyone understands it, but be intentional about it. So when are we going to get away for a night, um, for an evening, for a few hours of walking, something that doesn't have to cost any money? to just get away, but you, you have to make a point as a couple to do that and, and remember who you are, why you get together. The cooperation part, then to communicate better, it will happen, it, it is, uh, then, but you have to be intentional about the way to, to, to get away. Mm -hmm. Anything else here? Yeah, now we're empty nesters and we're still doing the co uh, cooperation that we sit down with our calendars and kind of say, okay, this week brings <laughs> this and this from his side and this and that from my yeah. side. We always look at the actually the, the next three months mm -hmm. because then I know, is he traveling? Does he know that he's traveling? Sometimes he doesn't. All of a sudden he tells me, honey, I got to go to XYZ and then he's gone for three nights. And, and that's fine because now we have a different life. But before that, when we're taking care of the kids, that was the sooner I knew, the better it was for me because then I could plan. So between um, June, July, August, Leonora has a standing weekly, basically, basically, when I'm not at home, I'm golfing. <laughs> how's, how's that? What do you think? She's golfing too. I'm so also, also golfing. Also golfing. Yes. So, yes. yeah. And I had one comment. Uh, you said, like, it changes from I to we. Uh, in our family, it works well because I always would say, I will do whatever you want me to do. So there is still an I in there. Just tell me that. Just tell me what to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, anything else? No. And they, we have an even longer testimony from these two on our mm -hmm. testimonials page on the website that we videoed last year. So it's fun if you want to hear more of their story and how they met and things like that. It's actually on the testimonials page, so it's kind of fun. All right, so what are the missions of the cooperation stage? So if you still have children at home, let parenthood strengthen, not threaten your marriage. Uh, tips for new parents. We have some new parents in here, so we'll go through these. Talk about what's ahead. Be frank about the losses as well as the gains. So there are losses when you have kids. You lose that time together. Um, maybe some of that passion because you have to have kids knocking on the door. Don't blame yourself or your spouse for marital blips. We have a support network. The guys just talked about that. They did a fantastic job um, when they had kids. Expect the unexpected, right? Olivia texted me like, we're going to be late because my babies are not cooperating, right? You don't know what's going to happen when you have That's small right. children. So expect the unexpected. Find time to settle conflicts and connect as friends. Invite romance back into your marriage. So every single stage... You don't want to leave out the intimacy. I can't stress that enough. Our mentor couples will say this. They meet with couples who haven't been intimate for weeks, sometimes years, and that really is hard on a relationship. Um, if you have not seen Mark Gunger's um, Number One Key to Incredible Sex, we have his DVDs out there in the library. We usually do that as an event in January. We'll be doing it again this January. But it's just 
kind of a, a lighthearted way to talk about something really, really serious. Um, so check that out if you haven't. And then de-stress and make love again. That's the last one. So thank you both thank you. for joining us. The next stage is called the reunion stage. So we go from cooperation to reunion. You may be in this stage if your children have left home and can take care of themselves. Your careers are running smoothly. You have more time for yourselves. Your finances are at least somewhat secure. <laughs> your ch oops, you, the two of you could start and finish a conversation without frequent interruptions. And you can perceive your spouse more sometimes as a business partner than a soulmate. That's kind of a, a negative one to this stage. You're wiser, kinder, more mature. It's the perfect time to refresh your marriage. So, Kevin and Carleen, come on down. All right. We've got their family up there. If you want to tell us a little bit about how long you've been married and those beautiful people up there behind you. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, we're Kevin and Carlene Witter. Uh, we've been married 33 years, 34 in September. The panel's getting older, have you noticed? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. We're on the older end. <laughs> uh, we have uh, three children uh, and five grandchildren. Um, so the two oldest are married and the youngest is not. Um, and um, what else? <laughs> Cover that pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> so we, when we think about this reunion stage, um, <clears throat> oh, we're we're mentor couple uh, for about three years now. We we enjoy that a lot. Um, but when we think about this reunion stage, we think about um, it was a lot of fun, or because we transitioned, and you come in and out of these things because what happened for us. Um, is when our kids left, we started dating again, and it was a blast. And it was a lot of fun, and we're still dating. <laughs> but um, now we find ourselves between kind of bookend between grandkids and aging parents. Hmm. And so you want to spend time with, with the grandkids, but at the same time you want to take care of mom and dad. And, and it adds a lot of stress um, so, you know, we do find it really important that uh, we do make dates and we do get out. Um, but we're going through really kind of a tough time right now trying to, trying to spread ourselves across all this, uh, all these people. Um, so. Which in turn has been tough on us because we're not communicating. Right. Not tough on us, but I mean, we're not communicating the way we should or hope to. Um, yeah. I, you know, one of us is gone or, mm -hmm. you know, so um, it goes back to the communication someone said before too, though, but yeah, yeah, it's, tough. It's, a, it's a wonderful time. It's a tough time. Um, at the beginning of it, it took me like two months to figure out I didn't have to buy three gallons of milk anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I go to the grocery the store you know, when, before the boys, you know, when they were still home, mm -hmm. you, you just, it, it kind of was a, it was a process because, you know, all of a sudden you have that last one sitting at home with you at supper and he's like, yeah. <laughs> you know? And but, we tortured uh, that boy. Yeah, I mean, did torture. Yeah, so many everything was aimed right at him. You didn't have to spread it with his brothers anymore. You know, so as that time went on, and then you change and you learn to adjust, and you kind of figure out that you're not so needed anymore. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of have to transition that your husband still needs you mm -hmm. um, at a different level or a different pace than your children needed you. So um, I'm kind of reflecting backwards, but. Mm -hmm. um, it was fun. It is good. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, okay, two married, one to go. <laughs> when they're married and what they, when they find their significant others, it would be nice when the last one does and we don't need to. But this reunion, so I mean, you could eat when you wanted, what you wanted. You didn't have to worry about anybody else's schedules other than ours. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just a really, it took us back to mm -hmm. when we would date and when we would, yeah. we used to sit when we dated, we used to sit right outside Carlene's apartment under this um, street light and we talk for hours mm -hmm. and tell each other about um, you know what it actually it was a daily dialogue so in mm -hmm. mentoring you teach about daily dialogues and talking about it every day <coughs> and expressing to your partner what did you find uh, 
acceptable in the uh, in the marriage or the partnership. What didn't you find? What did you find dissatisfying? And then what are you going to do to help each other um, with that? And we did that. And then when we got back in the reunion thing, we started doing that again. It was a lot of fun. Mm. Hmm? Good. Yeah. Should say. Okay. So, what are the missions for this stage? So, like they just I mentioned, there's know. shift. There's a shift in focus back to just the marriage, not the kids per se anymore. It's shifting back to your marriage, sharing your feelings, looking forward to a new relationship with your children if you have children. If you have free time, hang out with your spouse. Put yourselves on the calendar. Uh, anticipate disagreements. Be slow to judge and quick to appreciate. Another mission is to get off autopilot. So polish up those communication skills, keep using the I statements, don't make assumptions, maybe find a joint fun project to do together, rediscover old pleasures. You just mentioned one, the daily dialogue. Uh, see your partner as you did when you said I do. Get a fresh perspective on your own life. Uh, and then look ahead to retirement. Welcome boomerang children without neglecting your marriage. If that happens, if they come flying back into the house, then that's something you might have to deal with. Use your marriage to create good health. So maybe work out together, take a vacation, take responsibility for your health, and then learn all you can about one another. So thank you very much. So the next stage after reunion is called explosion. So you can imagine, I think you guys have already, these two have mentioned some of the things that are in this stage. So you may be in this stage if you and your spouse has just experienced a major career, health, or parenting <coughs> crisis. Catastrophe has struck your home or family. Could be a major positive experience like winning the lottery or getting a promotion that dramatically changes your role at work or at home. Um, Caring for the aging parent that they mentioned can be part of this uh, stage as well. So explosions can rock your marriage at any time with little warning. Turning misfortune into triumph requires dedication and patience, flexibility and humor, affection and resourcefulness. The time span of this explosion stage is extremely variable. Sometimes it lasts a few weeks, sometimes it could last years. Um, we're going to talk about the five biggest challenges in life that can impact your marriage. So a major illness in your marriage, caring for an aging parent was just mentioned, depression, job loss, weight gain. So before we go into that in a little more detail, I would like Don and Karen to join us up here. There's their cute wedding picture and then a current picture. So tell us how long you've been married, and a little bit about yourselves first. Glad you didn't use the picture from the banquet. That is the picture from the banquet. Hmm? <clears throat> no, the introductory picture oh. from the banquet. <laughs> I don't like to have my picture taken. <laughs> We're Don and Karen Davis. We've been married for 33 years. I've been married 33. He's been married 40. Okay, it's my um. second marriage. <laughs> uh, we have two children. Our daughter is 26, and she 28. lives in... Chris is 28. He's 30. Oh. <laughs> He's two years behind. Yeah. You haven't invited me to the party, evidently. Okay, our daughter's 28, and, uh, and she lives in Green Bay, and our son is 30, and he lives in Milwaukee. Uh, we have no grandchildren. Uh, my daughter has not been able to find anybody. We're both retired law enforcement, by the way, so she hasn't found anybody that meets our criteria yet as, as far as marriage and, uh, marriage and a lasting relationship. She kind of wonders how we check up on these people, and you know, I'm not a big Facebook guy, but you sure can learn a lot on it uh, who they're dating. So, the explosive stage is actually um, a stage that you can go through at any time in marriage. This isn't sequential with the other stages that we just listened about. And in 2004, the first crisis that we met was. Uh, nearly divorcing. But we got through that by forgiving. And that was a major thing. That's what carried us through and bearing the hatchet, not bearing each other for the things that we had done wrong. The next crisis that, the next major crisis that we came to was caring for his aging mother. 
Um, she wanted to live <coughs> independently. She had a clear mind, and Don ended up being her full-time caregiver, being there to help her with meals three times a day, being there at night when she needed, being there in the middle of the night whenever she was afraid or something was going wrong. And that resulted in another crisis at the same time when Don retired earlier than he wanted to because the caregiving was taking over so much of his life. The way we got through that, the process in that crisis, was that I came alongside Don to help him with all of her daily needs, all of her um, every need, and that included taking her to um, specialists on a weekend when her cataract surgery failed and she ended up with triple vision and such high pressure in the eye. And uh, the very last thing with her was a stroke. We were together through all of that. But the other big explosive crisis in our lives was that in 2010 I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. So when you talk about the crisis, the explosions, these are things that rock your world, they turn your life upside down. And you have to figure out how to get through this because something scars your relationship. Just like an accident, something will scar your marriage. It'll injure your marriage. But you'll heal from it. You'll never forget what caused the injury, but you'll heal from it. And a lot of the things that we went through that were explosions in our marriage had to do with things that we did kind of against each other. But through that, when we came together to go through all of the other stuff, you can make it through any crisis as long as you do it together. So with the brain tumor, when I was diagnosed with that, we are still caring for his mother. Now we had to deal with meeting with a neurosurgeon, meeting with a radiation oncologist, meeting with a, um, you know, whatever doctor I had to meet with, and trying to get someone to take care of his mom so we could be relieved of that responsibility. But that was another crisis because a family member said, you know, we've got non-refundable tickets to, you know, go to wherever, so I'm sorry we can't help you. So we were stuck. This was a huge crisis in our lives. Our world was just turned upside down, and nobody is there to help us with the other crisis that was daily ongoing with his mother. We made it through because we did it together. We figured it out. We found somebody to help with his mom so he could go with me to all of my doctor appointments. I went through 28 days of radiation, and he was there through all but maybe three because friends wanted to go with me. So... We learned that in the crises of life, the explosions that happen, the way you get through them is you do them together. Because if you're going through something, there's a beginning and an end, and you've already gone through the beginning, you're in the middle somewhere. There is an end, an end always comes, and we did it together. And through all of that, our relationship has become stronger and so strong that if you've seen the movie Fireproof and they glue the salt and pepper shakers together, that's what our life is like now. Because we did this together. We didn't let it destroy our marriage. We, we used that as a, a building resource to, to make us stronger. And, you know, the same as the Witters, you, you go through these things and... You're finding your relationship all over again. And that's what happens in the explosion stage. You, you find that you've been through this together, you know, and that strengthens a relationship when you go through it together. So the humor part of this, we've got to have some humor. For yeah. it, it, it was in your email. Um, you know, after you... Because this brain tumor came on sudden, really no symptoms or anything. She was actually in for something else. 
Well, it, it, the it, the it, symptoms weren't the brain tumors. The, yeah. yeah. So neck pain. Going through this process of going to these doctors and these, you know, you start to think, boy, I wonder if I have a brain tumor too. You know, you start going through all these these different things. So um, she he's, saw he's, this, but he's putting me through the doctors, putting me through these tests, <laughs> and so the doctor's facing and, her. You know, to see if and she looks over, and I'm sitting there going. <laughs> He's copying me. (laughs) But again, it's the fact of readjusting and going through it together and the fact that God saved our marriage back in 2004, so we each had each other to to lean on during this time period. You become each other's strength. Mm -hmm. That's teamwork. Yes. Wow. Stay there. Missions. So the missions here are as varied as the explosions themselves. Common ground, finding coping strategies that work no matter what you face, which these two obviously had to do. Communication, support, acceptance, flexibility. Oops, I just switched to... Don't look at that one yet. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, So the, the five challenges that I mentioned earlier, the major illness, caring for an aging patient, parent, depression, job loss, and weight gain. So they talked about the major illness part, the crisis. It calls on both spouses to find new ways to stay open and intimate with one another. So first might come some shock, right? I have a brain tumor. Next comes the long haul. Your roles may change drastically, and the future may not look the way that you hoped it to look. So what can you do? Accept your reality, educate yourself, Assemble a support team for the well spouse, pronto, right? You have to find people to support you. Um, They also talk about touch, shower each other with physical affection, and redefine intimacy during those times when one person might be sick. Uh, Caring for the aging parent, I think we've talked about that and um, some of the things these couples have done, but maybe a designated caregiver. We did an event last year at Sharon S. Richardson, on caregiving. So if you are in that stage and you're caring for aging parents, they have some great resources over there at Sharon S. Richards Hospice Center. Um, They talk about depression. I think last year someone on the panel had talked about this. So watch your spouse. Like when you get to these things, be alert to small changes. Don't wait for your spouse to hit rock bottom. Find a mental health counselor for both of you if you need it and be alert for relapses. Protect your marriage. Admit that you cannot cure your partner's depression if they're depressed. See depression as an intruder into your marriage. Find support. Conquer depression before you try to work on your marriage. That was probably not going to be too effective if one person's depressed. And then respect your own needs. Um, Also something that can happen is job loss in this stage. That could be, or any, it doesn't even have to go in order. Like Karen said, if somebody loses a job, that is an explosive event. Um, in your marriage, it's going to be economically challenging, so you may need to um, listen to your wife, who is the budget person, like, <laughs> and set common goals and support one another and stay positive. Um, so thank you to these two. Um, uh, there's also some universal needs during crisis, which are empathy, patience, humor, dedication, and intimacy. And what do we all need? Communication, support, acceptance, and flexibility during those times. So the last stage is completion. So you may be in the completion stage if the building stages of your marriage, like kids, career, saving for the future, are over. Health and happiness are more important issues today than career and child raising. Fighting between you and your spouse has declined substantially, and you've probably been married for more than 25 years. So there's no question that the years after retirement can be the best of your life, and we have Steve and Sue to come up and talk about that. So welcome, Steve and Sue Jaber. You have a retired school administrator and healthcare administrator, so we work on notes. Hey, they brought notes. (laughs) Hi, this is Steve, and I'm Susan Jaberg. And um, we dated four years before we got married, and now we've been, actually, we just celebrated our 43rd wedding anniversary, so we've been together 
um, a great portion of our lives. Um, we are covering the completion completion stage, but we actually consider this the celebration stage. Um, after evolving and succeeding through the first six stages, which we went through many, many times, mm -hmm. you don't just, you know, you, you explode and you go through some of the stuff many, many times in your marriage. It just doesn't happen once and then it's done. Mm -hmm. uh, we've experienced very stressful careers, children, grandchildren, building homes, buying homes, saving money, caring for parents and burying parents. And um, we've had all the stressors and experienced it all at this point in our marriage. And in fact, we've mentored many couples. And when we first meet with them, we know their background and all the things that they've experienced. Many of them they have nothing on us. And, they, and they're sitting there like this. And I'm going, man, just communicate, and it would be so wonderful. And, um, and um, so, we, so sometimes, you know, it's frustrating when we're working with these couples because they haven't had a lot of these issues. They just make everything an issue. But so few couples are actually fortunate enough to ever get to this point. And we realized that. We went to our class reunion uh, last year, and they said, how many of you are married this long, this long? And we were the oldest couple married, mm -hmm. and uh, so we were pretty proud the of that. Year. The longest, mm -hmm. not the oldest, the longest. <laughs> we, were the, all, we were all the same age, but um, so uh, we were pretty proud of that factor. Yeah. We're, we're glad to kind of make it into this, this, final, this final stage. When you walk into our house, there's a little plaque, and it said, um, take a deep breath, you're home. And it's kind of like getting to this stage. It's like we went through all that. We take a deep breath. Now we're now we're here, and it really is more of a celebration stage than a um, than a completion stage. I call this stage um, the ing stage. I n g the ing stage because finally now because we're retired and and things have been kind of you know dealt with, challenged with, we now have time to do ing things. So now we're walking and bicycling and kayaking and paddle boarding and golfing, and traveling, and volunteering, and napping. <laughs> kind, of, kind of a neat stage. Hey, um, it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, so we're in the ing stage, and, and, and we really, really enjoy that. You know, I've read several times um, in, in many places that physiologically the human body replaces every human cell every seven years. Um, and I think there's truth to that. I, the person, so, so Sue and I have been married for 43 years, so, you know, I've been married to six different Sues mm -hmm. in, in, terms of, in terms of body cells. And, and I think that's true. The person that we dated and married in the beginning is, is a far different Sue than I have now, and vice versa. So we're constantly reacquainting ourselves with a new person in our marriage. Um, and so we keep going back to the fundamentals that we learn, and we're never done with the communicating. Um, you know, I, I, think the th I think the three biggest challenges that we see in mentoring and, and, and maybe in most of our lives is communication, finances, and intimacy. Um, this, is, this is reoccurring, and this is something that, that we try to become personally stalwarts at, at, at dealing with um, because I think if you can overcome those three um, you've gone a long way to keeping a, a happy and a stable marriage. I think um, we talk about, um, you've talked about love languages several times, and, and the love languages um, you'll learn, I, I won't give those, but I think there's also ways of interpreting, learning how to interpret the words that your spouse uses. For instance, Sue will say to me, honey, when you get a chance, could you fix this? And what she really is saying is, Get off your rear end and fix it now, please. <laughs> and so, so you learn how you, you learn you learn the language. Yes, and I, I can respect that, and, and I've I've learned to enjoy that. Um, and and yeah, we have a, we, speaking about the other plaque. We have a plaque that says, T "Welcome home." You know, take a deep breath. You're home. We also have another plaque that says. Um, Take your shoes off or wipe the floor. The choice is yours. You know? so, so there's also signs of signs of, of direction. Um, the um, I think I think you've done this right when you know that you have found someone in your life 
that you can comfortably share your life with, that you can comfortably share your name with, and that you can comfortably share the bathroom with. Um, And it's that kind of comfort, I I think, um, and joy in this stage of life that's been so good. Um, We do have grandchildren, and, uh, and so we get to experience kind of being a parent again, only from a from um, from from a distance. So vicariously, we get mm-hmm. to we get to be parents again. Um, this has been a very um, good stage. Um, we at first we felt, um, you know, a little bit like the completion stage. Sounds like okay, well now it's you know pretty much over. You know? <laughs> there's there's nothing left. And in many ways, we've rediscovered our life. Where I think there's almost a rebirth. Mm-hmm. After after your retired um, jobs, careers, and things are dealt with, and there's a refocus again, and it's I get to date date again, you know, and, and we get to be uh, involved in um, in real growth, and so it's it's been a, it's been a good stage to finally make it here. <laughs> awesome. So here's the missions: keep your marriage growing. Like you're not done; it's not complete. You want to keep it growing. Play and be in the moment. Um, under this point, they talk about volunteering together. And as you can see, they are mentors here, so they, and I'm sure they volunteer for many other things as well, but a great stage to maybe think about mentoring if you're in this stage. Share a new sense of meaning and purpose. So you're stepping into a new role. Maybe look up old friends, look for new meanings in your marriage. And then the last one is reorganize your time, your territory, and your tasks, so you might need to shuffle housework or balance um, and keep connected. And of course, as they mentioned, intimacy, we want to mention that at every stage, how important that is. So thank you to Stephen. So the eighth stage that we added is widowhood. So one spouse has passed away, facing, you're facing grief. Grief takes time and effort. You want to care for yourself, maintain physical, emotional, and psychological well-being, maintain relationships with family, friends, and coworkers, uh, and remember your loved ones. Celebrate those memories. Knowing your strengths, address difficulties to overcome, develop coping strategies, consider networking options um, here at Great Marriages. Last January, so it's been about a year and a half, we started a widow-to-widow group here. So Jeanette uh, Martinek was on our board of directors. She was a widow. She came and spoke to a small group of widows, and then uh, Barb Wagner took over and kept the group going. So now they meet once a month, uh, the second Friday of every month here at Great Marriages. So if you know someone who became, it's just this one, this group is for women, for widows. Um, It's a great support group. They have guest speakers come in, and it's just uh, wonderful for these ladies to uh, have support for each other. And there's a range. Some have been widows a long time. Um, The last new person that came, it was just a few months for her. So they come around and and support one another. Continue financial stability and sustainability. Um, Some of them, we had a topic once, do they date? Do they not date? Uh, Live with peace, joy, and purpose. So, Mary, will you join me up here? Welcome to Mary Tooney. And Mary has actually been a widow twice, so I'm sure she's going to tell you a little bit about that. And just how my mom's a widow, my dad passed away seven years ago, and some will remarry, some won't. My mom has no interest in, my husband always thinks, does she want to date her? (laughs) Oh, nope, she's completely fine. Um, by herself. So I'd like Mary to talk a little bit about her experience. Well, I'm here to discuss something nobody ever wants to discuss, <laughs> um, the death of a spouse. Um, it's yet another adjustment in life. It's another new beginning. Um, and as you think of it, um, one of you will probably have to face this in your end of life. I became a widow twice in my life. The first time, my husband was 56 years old. He had a stroke. Yeah. And he needed 24-hour care for 14 years. Mm -hmm. So I had to continue to work. He lived at home for two and a half years, and I got care in for him daily. Um, And at one point, his doctor stopped me and said, you're going to have to find somewhere for him to live. You're going to kill each other this way. It was was just taking too much out of both of us. And um, I was married to him for 48 years. And after... After he passed away, um, 
I vowed I would never get married again. I told my children enough, <laughs> but I discovered you can love again. My second marriage, um, I was married nine years to um, a wonderful man, and um, he was diagnosed with shingles, um, and ten days later he died. The shingles went to his brain, and he had meningitis and encephalitis. And so um, the feelings that I experienced with each one was totally different. Um, after a lingering illness, when someone has suffered so much, um, you almost feel a sense of relief. You've grieved for all those years, and you, um, you, you feel relief, but after that, you feel guilty for being relieved. Um, and then when, um, when my second husband died, we were having a good time. I mean, we, we had a wonderful time together, as much as two old people can have. <laughs> it's not the same. Um, but with a sudden loss, you're, you're kind of in a tailspin. You don't know exactly how to feel. Um, and you're surprised by the feelings that you have. Um, my th first thought was after everything was over, the funeral and everything, and after his kids helping me sort things out, I thought, well, I guess I can handle this. But I couldn't. Um, I was surprised at my feelings. I was sitting in my house one day, and I thought, what's wrong with me? I, I could hardly get out of my chair. I just, mm -hmm. I just sat. And um, it's... Everyone grieves differently, but um, just don't be surprised at how you feel when, when and if it happens to you. And I realized that as I, um, I stayed in the house that we were living in, and one of the things that helped me the most is by changing things in the house um, to make them new, because it's, it's a new beginning, and so you, you change a few things. And then I would find myself getting finished with one thing and I wouldn't know what to do, so I started making lists for myself. I would make lists of things that I wanted to do and friends that I thought I should see and um, just to take up those, those dead spots that you just, you just don't know what to do. Um, but um, like I said, just don't, a person shouldn't be surprised at some of the feelings they have. Um, when you go through grief. Mm -hmm. But my husband passed away just six months ago, and uh, I'm adjusting. Thank you, Mary. And Mary is also volunteering here at Great Marriages now. Every Friday, you will, if you want to give her a call and say hello, she's here um, Friday mornings for us, and we really appreciate uh, that, for her doing that for us. So the missions in the widowhood stage... Figure out how to live alone again is what Mary's doing right now. Um, trying to figure that out. Getting finances in order, changing beneficiaries, health and financial powers of attorney need to be changed, and then these coping strategies. Um, it's not easy. Um, and getting a support network to help you um, mm -hmm. is it's going to be a great help. Um, fortunately, when my dad passed away, uh, my mom... She moved, like you're saying, you do things differently. They had a house in Oosburg and it was for sale and they had built a house in Random Lake, so my mom actually moved to Random Lake and got out of the house that, uh, so my, they had never lived in the Random Lake house together and that was helpful for her, I think, to just have different, um, different space to be in. Um, and then network with others uh, in a similar situation, church support, and as I already mentioned, the, the second Friday of each month here at Great Marriages. So thank you very much, Mary. We appreciate that.